prepare our ears to listen. Remove the covering of our eyes that we may see the words that you have written for us. And that our hearts and our minds, O oh Lord, will be able to receive what you have prepared before there was anything that was made in this world. I pray, Lord, that our hearts is ready because you are there by the presence of the Holy Spirit. You will comfort us, words that will comfort, words that will give us strength to continue living for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Doris, you missed yesterday. Yeah, me too. I'm so, couldn't make it. It was a strange day yesterday. You didn't hear Sister Nita prayed for the first time yesterday. You heard her pray for the first time yesterday? She's been yeah. praying, Sister Nita. She has been praying. She had, been, she had prayed in the past. Anyway, we are now, as you have realized, we've been studying the book of Ephesians. Mm -hmm. We have learned that in the book of Ephesians, this, who, who, who is Paul writing this book to, or this letter, or these epistles? You remember? Who is he writing to? <laughs> <laughs> huh? the to the Ephesians, <laughs> Ephesus, yes. to the uh, yeah. believers in Ephesus, and to us. So yes. he is writing to the Ephesians, and what what are the state of the Ephesians at this time? What are their state of mind? Where where, where what are they thinking right now at the moment? When this was written. Yeah, but what was, what was their state of mind? They were poor, spiritually poor, not knowing the spiritual blessings that they, uh, had been given to them, that they'd been accepted, that, she's been, that they had been accepted, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, mm. sealed with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Those are the spiritual blessings that God intended for us. That's the first, uh, that's chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. And also in verse 1 also, it tells us that when you become a Christian, you did not choose it yourselves. God chose you. He called you out. And there are three things that has happened to you when you become a Christian. You are a saint, right? You're a saint. That means you have been put in a position to be faithful. That's the second part. You have to be faithful. Faithful to who? Faithful in Christ. Yes. Right? And then, after that, Paul, uh, there, there is this phrase that's called grace and peace. Grace and peace, they comes together. It tells us that we can never have peace with God before we receive grace. The only time that we will have peace with God, the only time we will have reconciliation with God is because he had reconciled himself first to us. So therefore we have peace because we have received this grace. Okay. And then he declared to us, as Sister Rose, he said that uh, the Ephesians were so rejoicing and to be reminded by Paul that you should rejoice because you have been chosen, you have been adopted, you know, even before the creation of the world. And then <laughs> last night we learned about that there is a power. God intended to give us power towards us. The power to pray. His power, we learned two things. Kratos, that's the other one, that's energy. And the other power that to create out of nothing, okay? And with man trying to do all these wonderful things, makes our lives easy today. We can have this study, although we, we are not face-to-face -face with each other. 
but yet all these things that has man made is this, these things that we have is ex, existed already. Okay, mankind could not do anything out of nothing. Only God does. His word is power. That's what it is. Tonight we're gonna deal with Ephesians two, Ephesians two verses one to thirteen. Anyone who wanna volunteer to read Ephesians two one to thirteen for the study tonight? Hi, Mark. Good evening. Hello, Sister Nita. <coughs> good Somebody. evening, Brother Ipi. Hi. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome once again. Praise the Lord. We are going to study Ephesians chapter two. Verses 1 to 13, yes. the unconditional yes. good news. <laughs> Thank With you. Brother Mark. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay. So you want to read it, Mark? Yes. Any volunteer to read Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 13? These, these are the verses that we're going to study tonight. Then we're going to look at it. How, how is it written? We're yeah. just going to... Yes. Okay. Volunteer. Okay. <clears throat> Made alive in Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you allow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desire and thoughts. Like, a re like the rest, we were by nature object of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. In transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable, incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One in Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and call <coughs> uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcisions that were done that done in the body by the hand of man. Remember that at that time you were spared uh, that you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizen citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought here through the blood of Christ. Amen. 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 So, welcome. Welcome to those who have just come. Donia, Dermin. All of you guys, the Salavante family, Doris Nita and Sister Rosie, welcome. And those so, who are watching in Facebook. Oh, and those that are watching in Facebook. All right. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome. So I hope that you have your Bible with you. Uh, this is not an exhaustive study. You can do, uh, do not think that we covered everything. Uh, there's always layers that you can, you know, you can glean from. So you, you study the Word of God and there's more to learn. We are just scratching the, the tip of our fingers when it comes to studying the Word of God. This is going to be the science 
and the song for the redeemed for eternity. This thing what they called agape. This thing what they called unconditional love by yeah. God. Yeah. So I pray that, uh, that uh, we would have an open heart that, uh, to listen to the words of God. Allow the words of God to sink in. Okay? If you have any question, please do que ask the question. And if you have comments, the Lord has, uh, has impressed you to make a comments that things that I did not see, but the Lord has said to it that you see it, share it so that it would be a blessing to others as well. Okay. So Sister Nita just read Ephesians 1, 1 to 13. And tonight we will discover that Paul is expounding in greater detail, in, in greater detail this wonderful truth of what's called unconditional good news in Christ, okay? Because that is what the gospel is, unconditional good news. God, listen to this, God unconditionally save you and me, and we shall see this more in details as we look in these passages, okay? The purpose of expounding this wonderful truth in Christ, this unconditional good news, is to establish the believers so that your faith become unshakable, Okay? What's the purpose? So that your faith will become unshakable. So that you will no longer be like reeds. You know the grass that's reeds, that's tall and slender. Oh, what is the characteristic of that? When the wind blows to the left, it will blow to the left. You know, it will, wind blows to the right, it blows to the right. What God wants us, he wants us to be like the cedar of Lebanon. That when the wind blows this way, you just become firm. You stand firm on what the word is written. So the purpose is that we become unshakable. And if there is ever a time that we Christians need to have faith that is unshakable, it is today. Because as we look at the events of the world, do you see the events of the world? <laughs> right? We are in this pandemic time and people are getting antsy, demanding this and demanding that. Because they thought that what their demands is a solution. But as a Christian, we know better. There is only one solution, and that is in Christ. Of course, our hope for you and for me, and that hope is only as our faith is resting on that rock. Who's that rock? Jesus Christ. So tonight, we will discover a truth that will make your faith so strong, so unshakable, that nothing will sway you from your hope, your assurance in Christ. Everything has to be in Christ. Okay? So in this verse, Paul begins verses 1, 2, and 3, pointing out man's predicament or what is pointing out our sinful problem, right? <clears throat> we can learn this if you have the time to read on your own. If you have the time later on, read Romans 1, verse 18 to chapter 3, verse 20. In that, Paul expound more on the universal sin problem and how he concluded that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Okay? What does that mean, under sin? They are dominated by sin. There is none righteous. There is none that doeth good. Not even, how many? Not even one. one. Then in Romans seven fourteen, he made this statement. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual sold as a slave to sin. We are slave. You know, sin is a constant force hovering over us. Uh, we could not run away from it. There is no place by our own selves that we can run and hide away from it. You could be in the mountains by yourself. Thoughts <laughs> will follow you everywhere. The only refuge we have is in Christ alone. Okay? It says in there that the law is spiritual, but I, and that I there, that word I in Romans seven fourteen is, that is a corporate I, the corporate universal I, that is the human race. That's us, all of us. And it says, I'm sold as a slave to sin. And that is what he does in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3. He paints this dark, dismal, hopeless picture of mankind. What's the reason? Why would he do that? Why would he put us so down to the ground and having this dark, you know, dismal, hopeless picture of man and woman? 
Why would he do that? Two reasons that he does that. Number one reason. This is one of the reasons why he does it. Why he paints this dark, dismal, hopeless position of mankind. Number one is to destroy all confidence in ourselves. That's the first reason. To destroy all confidence in ourselves. Our faith must never be in ourselves. We are not saved because of our faith. Remember that. We are not saved because of our faith. Nowhere in the New Testament is this thought. The New Testament teaches that we are saved by faith or through faith. What does that mean? By faith or through faith? Isn't that my faith? No. Faith is only an instrument or a channel by which we receive salvation. But the source of our salvation, who is the source of our salvation? The cause of our salvation is the object of faith, which is Jesus Christ. He is the source. Okay? <clears throat> now, we must never look at ourselves for any hope. You know, many times we look at ourselves like if you can, you're going to ask somebody to do it. It's like, man, if you want to do it right, do it yourselves. But regarding sin, my brethren, regarding sin, we have no hope of ourselves. Okay? Not even what God does in us contributes towards our ticket to heaven. Okay? We are saved entirely by grace. So we're going to look at that again. What is grace? Paul has to do this to destroy all our confidence in self before he can give us the good news of salvation. He has to do this. It is imperative for us to realize that within us, there's nothing good. That within us, that God does not owe favor to us. God is not indebted to us because we did something marvelous, that we did something wonderful. No. God did something for us. We are just the recipient of what God does. That's the first, that's the number one. Why? Well, that's one reason why Paul has to paint this dark, dismal, hopeless position that we are in. Second reason is that when you discover your total sinfulness, the gospel becomes more desirable. Okay? God is painting this dark, dismal picture that Paul wrote of mankind through Paul's writing so that the gospel may become desirable and he, that is God, may destroy any lingering of legalism that may be creeping into your lives. You know, legalism, things that you can do. With this in mind, with this introduction, in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, we can see here the matchless charms of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does he say in verse 1? Look at verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? As for you. Right? That's what he said. As for you. Now, if you have King James Version or a new King James Version, what's the next word for a new or as for you? What's the next three words? It says in the new King who James were, Version, who were dead in, that's good who were dead but on my on my on my on my bible this is king james version it says half he quickened do you have that in your translation mine is like a new half he quickened <clears throat> it's three says, words here yes what is it it says a it? new he made alive Ah, uh, that's good. That's a good translation. No, no. A new half he quickened. What translation do you have, sister? New King James Version? New King James, yes. Okay. That's, you see that's that the word, one, right? uh, Yes. Do you see the three words in there that I just asked you after a new? It's uh, I, italics. Do you, know, do you see it? Do you notice it in your Bible? It's italics. That should not be there. Yes. That three mm -hmm. words, half he quickened or he made alive, that should not be there. Okay. This is an addition. This is a scribal addition. Yeah, okay? but it's not italic in my Bible. Yeah, oh, it's not italic. Okay, you can underline that since it's not italicized in your Bible, you can underline that underneath after he uh -huh. said a new, and then that should not be there. That's, that's not supposed to be there. Okay. okay? <clears throat> 
because it will destroy uh, what Paul's uh, thoughts here. What should be there is, how should be there? What, re, what Paul really said is, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, or a new who were dead in trespasses and sins. Hello, sister. Welcome. You see that? A new who were dead in trespasses and sins. We are in Ephesians 2, verse 1, sister. Sister Bing. Welcome. Now, who does he mean by the word you? We Bing. think a new. Who is he, he talking to? Who is he talking to here? Okay. Remember the three pronouns that I shared to you last time? What are the three pronouns? You. you. Uh, us. And we. Remember we. those? Okay. Who is the you? Who is the you? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. And the word, uh, the word we? The Gentiles. Jews uh, the Jews. The Jews, the including Gentiles. himself. And then the us? The Jews. The us is the Jews and the Gentiles. All, all of us. Okay? That's the mean everybody. So who is he talking here in verse 1? And you, who were what? The Gentiles and the Jews. So he was talking to the Gentiles first. Okay? Verse 1, he says, And you Gentiles... Oh, who Gentiles. were dead in trespasses and sins. Sins. That is exactly what he said. He says, you Gentiles who were dead in trespasses and sins. What he means is that you are by nature spiritually dead and incapable of doing anything but sin. Imagine that. Have you heard a sermon like that today? Come to you and you were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, of course, granted, when this was written, uh, Paul wasn't there. Somebody has to read this in front of the people. How do you think they read this verse? How do you think they read this verse? Would you have read it? And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Is that, do you think, how you're going to read it? Or they will put emphasis on it? Of course, they will put Especially emphasis on it because they're talking to the Jew or to the to the Gentiles and you Gentiles who were dead in trespasses and sin. But he did not stop there, right? <laughs> it says what? And he continue. Where in in time past, right? Verse two, verse two, ye walk according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You, you see that? So what does that mean? What, what is he saying? Verse 1 and 2 is Paul here. It says that you are not only sinful by nature, but you are sinners by performance. Do you see that? Right? And you who were dead in trespasses, and sins, wherein in time past, before ye walk according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's what Paul is saying. Our performance is simply the fruit of what we are. If you look at the world today, in this pandemic situation, we see rioting. We see young people, male, female, young and old, breaking stores. How would you describe their, how would you describe that, uh, you know, that kind of living? Behavior. Hideous? What else? How would you describe that? How would you describe these young people nowadays, especially the one that we see on TV that they show all the time, breaking here in the Diamond District, uh, breaking all those uh, cell phone stores and passing it outside. They're not Robin Hood. They're rubbing the hood, right? What they're doing is just the byproduct of who they are. This unrighteousness that is showing in people is the effect of being ungodly. Okay? That's the byproduct of who they are. So that's what Paul is saying here. You are not only sinful by nature, but you are sinners by performance. Okay? 
performance, once again, is simply the fruit of what we are. Then, since you, you and I are born and are by nature sinners, our performance apart from grace is nothing but sin. That's all of us. This is what Paul is saying to the Gentiles. You are a bunch of sinners. There is nothing good in you. Not one of you are living a holy, righteous life. Imagine if you're sitting on that chair and you have no, you have no bloodline when it comes to the Jews. How would you feel? <laughs> you know? But this is what Paul is, is doing. He's doing this to put you down to the ground, to the dust, so that you look at yourself and say, man, what's going on here? This is getting personal. Is, it, is Paul getting personal here? Is death personal matters? Paul's concern is you will not perish. So that's what he's saying. You are incapable of doing what is good because you are dead in trespasses and sins. But it did not end there though, right? It did not end there. But now in verse 3, he turns to his own people, the Jews. And this is what he says. So imagine this in a, in a church. In one side, you have the Gentiles. And the other side, you have the Jews. And he's speaking to the Jews. You, Gentiles, there's nothing good in you. You are outside of Christ. And the Jews probably to the other side was like, yeah, Paul, you hit the spot. Yeah, tell them, Paul, go ahead. You know, when you heard this in the preaching, like, preach, pastor, preach, pastor. You know, tell the truth, pastor. And then what did Paul say in verse 3? Among whom also we. Who is he talking now? In verse 3. The Jews and the Gentiles. He said, he said first, we in verse 3. So in verse 1 and 2, he's talking to the Gentiles. In verse 3, he turned to his own people. You see, did you see it? In verse 1 and 2, he starts in verse 1. He says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's calling the Gentiles. And in verse 3, now he says, among whom also we. Then he turns to the Jews, his own people. He says, all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. Uh -huh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And where by what? By nature, the children of wrath, even as others. What? What is going on? Paul is running amok here. You know? In other words, what he's saying, not only are you Gentiles a bunch of sinners, but we Jews are in the same boat. Now imagine how quiet the, the church by now when Paul is saying this, right? We belong to the same category. Oh, but, it's just, but we are the descendants of Abraham. <laughs> you know, we are seven the Adventists. Oh, we have our choice right. We have, no, that Paul says, no, we are all in the same boat. You know, same category. We too have been fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We are by nature sinners and we are sinners by performance as well. The good news is, the good news of what he did was, look how he ended it in verse 3. How did he end that? And where by nature the children of wrath, right? Or in other translation, like the rest, we were by nature object of wrath. Imagine that. You and I are born in the camp of sin. All mankind, our very nature is dominated by sin. We are ruled by sin. Is that really true that we are all ruled by sin? In Romans 3 verse 9. In Romans 3 verse 9. It says... Romans 3, verse 9. This is what it says. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Do you see that word in there? Are we any better? Who is he talking now? To the Jews. Not at all. It says, we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. <laughs> See that? All of us, you Gentiles, 
we Jews are alike, all under sin. And then he added it in 1 John 5, 19. 1 John 5, 19. Now, why, Paul, by the way, again, let me ask you something. Why is Paul doing this? What is the reason that he's doing this? Or what is the topic for tonight? The, topic the for unconditional tonight? good news. Good news. Christ. Okay. So why is Paul painting all this dark and hopeless position that we are in? What is the reason? To destroy all the confidence on ourselves. So that you no longer have confidence in self. But isn't that what the world teaches us today? Have confidence. Believe in yourself. Isn't that what we teach? We, who are, who are parents, we usually do that to our children. Son, daughter, stand up. You can stand in your own. You don't need nobody. Do it yourself. And then, they, to attend, they start attending church. And then in the church, they teach us what? The Bible teaches, you have no confidence. Don't have confidence in the flesh. So we train our children to stand in their own two feet. And then when the Bible comes to them, the word of God, it teaches us, you have to have no confidence in the flesh. Do you see the war in there? The war within us. Okay. First John 5, 9, it says, this is John speaking. He speaks the same thing as Paul. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Do you see the predicament we are in? the predicament in that first john 5 9 there is no hope for you except through jesus christ we are by nature the children of wrath just like you gentiles mm. having painted this dark dismal hopeless picture of mankind paul now proceeded in verse four now if you look at verse one to three there's nothing good can come out of it in your study again you can write it down verse one two and three there's, it seems that there's nothing good can come out of it. But that's exactly what Paul did. He destroyed any idea of self-righteousness, legalism in mankind. That's what it is like. You Gentiles, we Jews, we are all in the same position. Children of wrath. We deserve wrath. But it did not stop there though. That's the good news about Paul. Okay, He's a pastor at all. And he is encouraging these people that were down in their feelings and their emotions because their pastor is in jail but the, but the one who is in jail is the one who is encouraging them then verse 4 happened look at what happened in verse 4 but because of his great love for us god who is rich in mercy huh? he loved us but god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Now, how did verse 4 start? Verse 4 starts with the word but. That word but is a very important word. Do not look at it as just another word, but that but in there, that word but in there is a very important word. That is in contrast. Paul now is saying, it's like, you were this you are trespasses. You are dead in trespasses and sins. You are children of disobedience. You are children of wrath. You do the desires of the flesh. That's what you do. All of us, Jews and Gentiles. But something happened. Right? This is in complete contrast to our sinful state and our inability to save ourselves. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, the word but that happened. He is rich in mercy because, that's the cause, because of his great love. Right? But God, who is he? He is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Remember, his love, God's love is unconditional. It is this agape love which loves us unconditionally. This is the kind of love that gives 
uh, if you have nothing, it gives value to you. You know, what do we deserve? What does mankind deserve? Death. Uh, what do we, mankind deserve? Death. Because God did something in us, because he put us in Christ, he gave us value. What happened to you now? Now you have become the apple of God's eye. Okay? So this love of God is unconditional. It is a love that is uncaused. We did not love God so that he can love us. He is love. He, it's not what he does. It's who he is. It loves the bad. It loves those sinners. That is you and me. Look at Romans 5. You have heard this before. Let me read this to you. Romans 5, 6 to 10. I'm just going to go a quick one with this. Romans 5, 6 to 10. You can see the uncaused love of God here. This love that loves the bad. This love that is unconditional. And it loves the sinner. And it read Romans 5, verse 6 to 10. Let me read it in your hearing. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Do you see that, my friend? My brethren? While we were still yet powerless, while we were still ungodly, while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, what did God do? He died for us. He died for us. He reconciled himself to us. And he gave us eternal life. You notice the word in there, while we were. What is that? Present tense, past tense, future tense. What is that? While we were sinners. Is that past tense, present tense, future past. tense? Where? Past tense. Past Remember tense. that. Yes. So while we were helpless, powerless, ungodly sinners and enemies, we were. Past tense. Reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's why it's called unconditional. You weren't there yet, but yet God has forgiven you already. Then, that statements are in the context of verse 5. Of Romans. Of Romans 5. Let me read you verse 5 of Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 5. This is the context of that. It says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you see it? Who has been given? It's been given already. You did not even know it yet. You did not even recognize that you are miserable, you are wretched, poor, blind, and naked. You did not even recognize that you are that. You are ungodly, you are powerless, you are sinners, and you are enemies of God. God did something for you already. That's why it's called unconditional love, uncaused. He did not love us because we did something wonderful or marvelous. He loved us because he is love. God is love. God is agape. That's the beauty of it, my brethren. He poured out. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then in Ephesians 2 verse 4, states that the source and the cause of our salvation is God's love. Ephesians 2 verse 4. Let me read it in your hearing. It says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. What is the cause? But, you see that? But because of his what? Of his great uh, love for us. Love and mercy. You see that? 
his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. But the fact that God loves you and me unconditionally is not enough to save us. This love of God towards us did not save us. So in verse 5 and 6 in Ephesians 2, go back in there, he expounds the fact of salvation. How did God save you? Not only did he love us unconditionally, not only is he rich in mercy, but he, is all, he also did something. He did something that when you philosophicalize the word of God, you will never comprehend it. You see, love is meaningless unless it is followed by action. Let me say it again. Love is meaningless unless it is followed by action. And God did not only say, I love you, he showed it. And when did he show it? While you were powerless, while you were ungodly, while you were sinners and enemies of God, he did something marvelous towards all of us. Now listen to verse 5 and see God's action which saved you and me. Verse 5. Verse 5 of Ephesians, 1, uh, Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. You see that? Two things happen here. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. That's the first one. God made us alive together with Christ. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that a tremendous statement? God made us alive, right? Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. Powerful. Tremendous statement. Now, first of all, that word begin made, right? In other translation, it's made us alive. Is what we call past historical tense. What does that mean? Past historical tense. You can write it down. Past historical tense. It means something that took place in the past. And therefore, Paul here is not talking about our new birth experience, nor our subjective experience as Christians. So what is it again? Past historical tense. It's something that happens in the past. Okay, before we were born, before we came into this world. What is he talking about? He is talking about truth that took place in Christ. Okay, past historical sense. So that word made in there, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together. In my translation here, made, okay, new international version. That's what it happened in Christ. To understand what Paul is saying, we need to go back to Genesis and the fall of man. Okay? This is quick. You know this already. But let's uh, just follow the narrative of the story. When God created Adam and Eve, not only did he create them in his image, but he created them to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Okay? We human beings were created as a temple of God, but when Adam sinned, he turned his back to God. He became self-dependent and the Holy Spirit left him and his life was plunged into darkness. Not only his life plunged into darkness, the whole world was plunged into darkness. In other words, at the fall, our first parents died spiritually, not physically, but spiritually. And since God created man to produce of his own kind, since Adam and Eve had no children when they fell, all their children were born after the fall of Adam and Eve. So they did not have any children before, this, before the woman was deceived and the man transgressed. Okay? Therefore, they were born spiritually dead. That is what Paul is saying here in verse 1. In verse 1 it says, And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. You and I were born spiritually dead. Now, legally, no law in the land will allow one person, especially an innocent person, to bear the guilt and punishment of a guilty person. Or you cannot transfer guilt and punishment. 
So legality wise, you cannot transfer righteousness also to others. So before God could save us, he had to qualify Christ to be our savior, representative and substitute. Now, how does he do it? How does he do it? How did God qualify Christ, the second person of the Godhead, to be our substitute, representative, and savior? Let's go to Philippians 2, verse 6 to 8. Can somebody volunteer to read that? Philippians 2, 6 to 8. So we're going to learn how did God qualify Christ, the second person of the Godhead, to be our substitute, representative, and savior. Any volunteer? Was it the verse? Philippians 2? 6 to 8. 6 to 8. I can read. Go ahead. Uh, 6 to 8. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the face of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Wow. You see what happened here in Philippians 2, 6 to 8? Christ emptied himself through the Holy Spirit, took the divine life of Christ, and through a miracle, united the divine life, that divine nature, with the corporate human life of yours and mine that needs redeeming in the womb of Mary. So that in the incarnation, divinity and our corporate humanity were joined together in one person. Now, this was a great uh, discussion has happened. It took the church 400 years to realize what's going on. It says, can Christ be 100% man and 100% God? How are we going to, to come to a resolution for this situation? Because this is what they consider the great mystery. So the Christian church wrestled with this for over 400 years. Finally, in 451 AD, in Turkey, the Council of Chalcedon, they came up with this creed. This is what they came up. That Christ was fully God and fully man in one person. This was called the unipersonality of Christ. This cannot be explained. It is a mystery, but this is what happened at the incarnation. Divinity and our corporate humanity that needs redeeming were joined together in one person in the womb of Mary. This is what the early Christian church uh, come, to, uh, come to a point. When was this? In 451 AD in Turkey, in the Council of Chalcedon. This is what the church came up to. That Christ was fully God and fully man in one person. Okay? This is not subjective, but an objective truth. Okay? The human race in Christ was made spiritually alive because the Holy Spirit was now joined back to the human race in that incarnation experience. Then look at the second part of verse 5. The first part of it, in my NIV, it made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. The second part is, it says, it is by grace you have been saved. Do you see that in your, in your, in your, in your, in your Bible? It is by grace you have been saved. I'm using an NIV. What does that mean? That simply means that we did nothing to disturb this grace. Grace, again, is unmerited favor. Even much more, grace is God doing something wonderful to the impotent, ungodly, sinners, and his enemies. 
What did he do? By grace, you have been saved. You personally, I personally have been saved. Isn't it wonderful to know that when we were impotent, when we were helpless, when we were ungodly and sinners and his enemies, God did something. By his grace, you have been saved. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. We can read that. We, we have read it before, so let me read it again in your hearing. In Romans 5.10, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That is Romans 5.10. Paul has already told us about this grace in Ephesians 1 verse 7. In Ephesians 1 verse 7 that says, In Christ or in Him, we have redemption through His blood. We have redemption to what? Through His blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of His grace. He did it in the riches of His grace. By His grace, God took the corporate man that's you and me. And he took his son and joined us together 2,000 years ago. This, of course, this in the womb of Mary, this incarnation, this event that has happened, this, this not, did not save us. But it qualified Christ to be our Savior because he and us become one. Okay? Okay. The incarnation happened, and it is a great mystery for the people. This did not save us. The incarnation that has happened in the womb of Mary did not save us, but this qualified Christ to be our Savior. Okay? Now, Paul puts it beautifully in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Somebody brought her to read 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul summarizes it in, ver in that verse. You have heard this verse before, but it's better if you can lay your eyes on it and read it of yourselves and somebody volunteer. First Corinthians... One, verse One 30. thirty. Yes. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. It says here in my translation, it is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. Now, the word wisdom is Sophia. This is the special knowledge. This is the knowledge of the truth. This is the knowledge of the gospel. And what is the gospel? It says that is our righteousness, or in other translation, justification. Holiness, that is sanctification. And redemption when Jesus Christ come. Isn't that beautiful to listen to that? It is God that did it. And he put us in Christ. And Christ has become to us wisdom, a special knowledge. The gospel, my friend, brethren, is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. He is to be our everything. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because you have heard it before in Ephesians 1, 1 to 14. The in Christ idea. It's worth repeating a truth that you need to be clear on. Okay? This is worth repeating for. God took us and put us in Christ. And by doing that, God made Christ to be our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and he is our all. Again, this union of divinity and humanity did not save us. It simply qualified Christ to be our savior. In fact, this union made Christ the second Adam. Keep in mind the word Adam in Hebrew, it has a collective significance. It means mankind. 
We read that before in Genesis 2 verse 7. Just like the whole human race was in Adam with his sin and therefore stand condemned. We read that in Romans 5 verse 12 and verse 18. Okay. Likewise, now God put the whole human race into Christ so that his history may be our history. Isn't that beautiful? By his perfect life and by his sacrificial death and by his resurrection, he brought to the human race the wonderful truth of salvation. That is, he gave us hope that nothing else could give us. Nothing else could give us except him. And that is what he mentioned in verse 6. And what does he mention in verse 6? Go back to Ephesians 2 verse 6 and it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Again, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Having united us in Christ, having lived a perfect life, and having died the wages of sin in verse 6, Paul tells us, and God raised us up. He raised us up. He raised us up, but notice it. He did not raise us up as individuals, but he raised us up corporately together. And that together means together with Christ. That's why when Christ was on the cross, we were with him. That's why Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But yet I live. <laughs> Isn't that so you were crucified with Christ. You died with Christ. And when he rose from the grave, you rose with him. Now, since we were united with him in the incarnation, then his life becomes our life. His death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. And thus he raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. That is the objective truth of the gospel that occurred 2,000 years ago. Let's hear a statement that Peter says in 1 Peter 1.3 regarding this wonderful truth before proceeding to the next verse. Okay? So whatever is true of Christ is true also of you. It's true also of me. Okay? In 1 Peter 1 verse 3, it says, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you see that? How did He do it again? In His great mercy. Have you got it? This is the wonderful, unconditional good news of salvation. In His great mercy, in His grace, in His marvelous grace. This is what God did. And we did nothing. He did all the work. He did all the heavy lifting. Now in verse 7, do you have any comments? Any questions? You can write it down if you are shy to, to speak. You can write it down and you can send it to, to those that you can send it to, especially to the one that are recorded this. Now in verse 7, Paul turns to the subjective truth to the future that in the ages to come. Listen to what he says. In order, this is verse 7 of Ephesians verse 2, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, express in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Beautiful words. Words that needs to be expressed more in Romans 8. So Romans 8 says the same thing. This is what it says. Romans 8 verse 21 to 25. It states the same, almost the same thing. Okay? It says in Romans 8, 
after reading that verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 21 to 25, it says, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Remember that, verse 23. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is sin is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We Christians have accepted this good news, are not saved in the fullness and reality. Okay? You accepted Jesus Christ, but are you saved to the fullest? Not yet. In reality. We are saved by faith today. We stand justified by faith today. But one day Christ is going to come and he is going to take us to heaven. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, 1 to 3. John 14, 1 to 3. It says, John 14, 1 to 3, it says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Those are the exceeding riches we will see one day, but right now, we have a hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation is guaranteed in Him, and one day when He comes, we shall be like Him. Okay, we shall be like him. Then Paul reminds his readers that they must never look at themselves for security or for salvation. Isn't that wonderful to know? Now, if you read again, look at verse 23 of Romans 8. It says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Right? So though... We have been redeemed by faith. Our nature, our body, it's still, according to the Bible, our nature is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. The flesh shall never inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Look at verse 8. Verse 8. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. How are we saved? My grace. It's not because of us. What does the Bible say? Through yeah. faith. Faith. Right? And this not from yourselves. So you are not saved because of your faith. It is the gift of God. Notice it. Salvation is more than a provision. God factly saved us by grace. This salvation is a gift and has to be received, and this reception is called faith. And this salvation becomes ours through faith. Look at that word, the last part of the verse 8. It is the gift of God. Do you see it? That word if in there, that word it, Right? You see the word it in there? In the, it is the gift of God. It, that yeah. refers to grace. Mm -hmm. Grace is a gift. We are saved through a gift because of God's abundant mercy. You know how we read that? Huh? We read that many, many times. His abundant mercy. His abundant grace. So we are saved through a gift because of God's abundant mercy. His great love for us and His redemptive activity in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. In Christ, in Christ, God has obtained salvation full and complete. And the reason why that salvation can be yours is because you were in that humanity of Christ that obeyed the law perfectly. You were in that humanity of Christ that died on the cross. 
because you have been crucified with Christ. And you were seated with Christ. And when he rose, you rose with him. So all your goodness, all your righteousness, all your holiness, all your obedience is in Christ. That's what God sees. That is how you are accepted. Not because of what you have done. Remember, verses 1, 2, and 3, in this chapter 2 of Ephesians, it tells us this picture, this doomish picture, this picture that it seems that there is no hope. Listen to this famous scholar and theologian. His name is Bruce Westcott. He says, this is what he says, that Christ was not just one man among many men, but that all men were in him, so that we were organically united to him. As we accept this truth, his death becomes our death. His life becomes our life. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. His ascension becomes our ascension. His sitting in the heavenly places at the right hand of God becomes our position too. And in the ages to come, we will discover this wonderful wealth, but right now, we accept it by faith. Isn't that beautiful to know? Then Paul adds verse 9. What did he say by verse 9? First, verse 8 again. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Our contribution is none. How much is our contribution when it comes Zero. to salvation? Huh? Nothing. nothing. None. Nil. Such. Nothing. <laughs> we are saved entirely by grace. Not by works so that no one can boast. You can boast that, Lord, I prayed three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. You know, if you read the story of Martin Luther, he used to, I do not know, I've I never been to Rome. And, you know, there is, they say that there is, a, there is a staircase in there that is very long. And Martin Luther used to kneel from the bottom of it, from the bottom of that staircase all the way up. And he would hit his back. And by the time he reached to the top, he realized, like, man, my mind is still sinful. I'm still thinking about lust. I'm still thinking about fornication. I'm still thinking about these worldly things. And this is the reason why we are not saved because of works, lest any man should boast. But Paul is also aware of our problem, our predicament as a Christians. Because even though we are saved by grace, although we stand perfect in Christ, there were no chains that has taken place in our nature, as I said earlier. Nothing. The only chains that happen within us, where? Where is the only chains that happen within us? In our chains mind. happen in our mind. In Ephesians 2 verse 3. That's where it happened. Right? Ephesians 2, uh, Philippians 2 verse 3. Philippians 2 verse 3. I think I have the wrong note. That the happen, the changes between us. I have the wrong note. Sorry, guys. Sorry. I have the wrong note here. The happen, the changes happen in our mind only. I could not find it. Sorry. Let me just check for a while. Mine, we need to 
minus only. What happened with that was that the mind and the flesh, okay, in sin, they love each other. They're connected. But when you have become born again, something happened. The mind did a U-turn, okay? In a sinful state, both the sinful nature and the mind were in harmony. I'm going to give you the text later on. I, I just lost it. But in a sinful state, in a sinful state, both the sinful nature and the mind were in harmony. Whatever the flesh desire, the flesh desire, the mind follows. Okay? It follows. Wherever the mind goes, the flesh will not hesitate. Hey, let's go this way. Let's just do this. But in a Christian, the mind has made a U-turn or a change of mind. You know, it is no longer in harmony with the flesh. It has turned to God. It has accepted Christ as its righteousness. So that's what happened. Okay, so here it is in verse uh, Ephesians 2 verse 3. What does it say in Ephesians 2 verse 3? I just lost the thoughts. So it's right here in our text. It says, All of us also live among them at one time. And listen to that. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh. See? And following its desires and thoughts. So the minds and the desires of the flesh, they are in harmony. And what kind of a person is described here? Is he a Christian or not a Christian? Not a Christian yet. But in a Christian, where we have learned, that where we have read earlier, you know, when Christ gave up his, his fullness, when he gave up him, himself, when we read Philippians 2, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equally with God something to be used to his own advantage. You see, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So once you become a Christian, what happened? You no longer put yourself first above others. That's why Christ can say, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father. When you become a Christian, the same thing would happen to you. You came also now, not to do your own will, but the will of God the Father, lead by the Holy Spirit. But before you have been converted, your mind and your nature or your flesh, they go hand in hand. According to Ephesians 2 verse 3. That is the lesson for tonight that we have. That says... Gratifying the cravings of our flesh, Ephesians 2 verse 3, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But in a Christian again, something happened. A change of mind occurs within. But the nature remains sinful, just as it was before our conversion. Therefore, we have a nature that is not only sinful as believers, but we have a nature that still loves to sin. You're a believer, but your nature still desires the things of the world, the glitters of the world. That's why there's always a struggle within us. The nature says, let's do this. The mind says, I'm not going to participate in that because my God is not glorified. See? See? The reason no more is like, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to get arrested. I'm not going to do it. You're no longer, the reasoning we have before is no longer effective now. Before your reason is, oh, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to get karma. No. Once you're born again, your reasoning now is, I'm not going to participate in that particular event. Is because what? 
because God is not glorified. God is not left it up. You see? In that certain event, I have become a stumbling block for others. Therefore, I'm no longer participating in that. That is now your reasoning. It's no longer about, I'm, not gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to get arrested. I'm afraid that my reputation is going to be solid. Oh, I'm, not, I'm afraid that you know, I'm going to get karma. Those reasoning no longer exist in you. But there still is because the flesh, the nature is still sinful. The gospel is not only unconditional good news. It is dangerous news because we can take this good news and say, since I am saved by grace, then I can do what I want. You know, that's called cheap grace. Oh, I'm saved by grace already. God did it all for me. So whatever I'm going to do, I'm okay. Because, you know, grace is greater than sin. My friend, be careful. That is called cheap grace. That is not Christianity. Okay? So in verse 10, Paul says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Notice carefully. Notice carefully. We are saved by grace, but we are not only saved to go to heaven. We are saved to do good works which God prepared beforehand in Christ. And since we have accepted him, we should walk in it. Do you see it? God did the heavy lifting, all the works that we could not do. When it comes to the plan of salvation, we have nothing to offer, but we are the recipient of it. And the history of what is true of Christ has now become true of us. Before we were converted, our mind and our nature or our flesh, they just go on in hand. They can go. There's no hesitation. There is no problem. You can do whatever you want. But you heard the good news. Somebody bring the good news to you. You heard the good news. You weigh the evidence. You believe the evidence. And you obey it. By grace. Through faith. It's God who did it all. Now that you have been born again, something happens within you. Though your nature is still sinful because nothing changed in it, your mind has turned towards God. You have now a change of mind. You're concerned now before, your concern before is self. But now your concern the most is to the glory and honor of God. But you might, people might think, well, because of grace, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So I can sin, I can continually live in sin. God forbid, my friend. God forbid. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now that you have been born again, you have responsibility. God has given you tasks to accomplish. That's what we get to notice carefully. We are saved by grace, but we are not only saved to go to heaven, we are saved to do good works which God prepared beforehand in Christ. And since, again, we have, have accepted him, we should walk in it. Now the concluding verse. Verse 11 to 13, it says, Therefore, that word therefore means that is because you have been born again. It says, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember, that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. See that word again? But now, that was your life then. 
You were ignorant of God. You were blinded by the prince of this world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Do you see the beauty of it? Do you see that statement in it, the wonderful statement? Paul here is making this tremendous, grandiose statement. He says that the salvation God obtained in Christ is not only reserved for the Jews. It's applicable also to the Gentiles. It says that's what the mistake of the Jews has. They thought that salvation is only for them. But in the beginning, that's not what it is. That's why the Lord says, my house is called the house of the people. For all people. My brethren, the gospel is all inclusive. Salvation of the Gentiles was not an afterthought. Your salvation, my salvation is not an afterthought. It is part of the plan of God. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit covenanted to do it even before the world was made. The Jews, unfortunately, did not see salvation of the Gentiles in the Old Testament, but it was there. But Paul is saying that this unconditional good news of salvation is not limited to the Jews. It is not limited to the Gentiles. It is not limited to the elect. It is, not, it is a gift for all mankind, but it has to be received. Somebody going to give you a gift, you have to receive it. But many of us, you know, we receive a gift, but we don't really appreciate the value of the gift. And I pray that we know the value that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation is a gift for all mankind, but it has to be received. Brethren, my prayer is that you will receive this truth and rejoice with me in Jesus Christ. He has given it all through His Son, Jesus Christ. He reconciled Himself first to us. While we were impotent, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, and while we were His enemies. And He did not stop there of reconciling himself to us. He gave us also the ministry of reconciliation. And it's just remember that you are no longer living in that life. Though your flesh has not seen a transformation, but your mind has been created anew. The spirit of your soul, when you have become born again, has now under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Then we can guard now the avenues of our soul. This is the unconditional good news that Paul is spoken here in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3. It is by grace, not of works, so that we would not boast of how much we have done. Huh? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God longs you, my friend. He knows you by name. You are here right now listening because he has drawn you with his everlasting love. Many of us Maybe we're sad. Maybe we do not know what's going on in our life. But always remember, you have a new history. And your history is in Jesus Christ. What is true of him is true of you. This is what the Apostle Paul wants us to know. That we knew there is no value in you. God gave us the value. And that value is through his blood. He is rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Thank you for your time. If you have any question, you can ask. If you have any statement of, that you have learned, uh, speak, share.
so that all of us will be blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Mark, for the powerful message of God's unconditional good news. Praise the Lord. So any comments? Maybe after we pray, we will pray first. 